And we return for the second half of the lecture to talk more about the science of climate change. I want to mention that there's a video clip for you to watch. We have another episode of Frozen Planet, and this one is focused more on the effects of climate change. You only need to watch the part about Antarctica. One thing I'll mention is that this episode was apparently controversial enough to not be aired on any American network television networks or to be put on Amazon Prime for streaming. And it is very frustrating to me that the science of climate change is seen as controversial and that it's been, oops, and that it's acceptable for it's acceptable for people to be in elected positions and positions of power and deny that it's happening because the data are clear. But anyhow, um, there are also two articles on climate change and on the effects of climate change in Antarctica for you to read. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about those um, during lecture 16. Now, carbon dioxide and methane, which are responsible which are greenhouse gases responsible for anthropogenic climate change are compounds that contain carbon. And carbon cycles throughout different places or different reservoirs, AKA places where carbon compounds remain for a measurable amount of time. The same way that water cycles between the atmosphere and the oceans and glaciers in the water cycle. Water does change phase. It goes between being solid and liquid and gaseous, but it doesn't change chemical composition at all. Um, the carbon cycle actually does involve some changes in some changes in chemical composition, in that carbon can either be a hydro can either be say a hydrocarbon, um, as it will be when it is in the form of the hydrocarbons that make up plants and trees or fossil fuels, or it can be CO2, like you get when like you get when plants decompose or when living things are eaten or when fossil fuels are burned, or they can be in the form of carbonates, um, like when like when marine organisms take up um, CO2 in the water to convert it to solid calcium carbonate. And carbon is present in living organisms. It's present in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. It's present in the oceans as carbonic acid and as the solid calcium carbonate that makes up the shells of corals, snails, clams, and even phytoplankton, the little microscopic um, marine algae. And we often focus on the processes that either add CO2 to the atmosphere or take it out of the atmosphere because of our interest in the atmospheric concentrations of CO2. Earth's atmosphere is one reservoir of carbon. Carbon takes the form of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere. And it's the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere that is causing problems. And like any reservoir, the atmosphere will have sources in regards to CO2 or processes that add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere as well as sinks that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, usually by converting CO2 into another compound like hydrocarbons or carbonate. The main sources of CO2 are decomposition of dead matter, as well as burning of organic matter, which includes burning of fossil fuels and volcanic eruptions, which emit CO2 among the various gases in its fumes. When you see lava bubbling, those bubbles are from carbon dioxide escaping as well as other gases. CO2 can be removed by um, burial of organic carbon, like when, like when the plants um, for, that grew in the coal swamps were buried before they completely decomposed. That sequesters the carbon in the earth and actually keeps it out of the atmosphere. And that is how fossil fuels form. One great irony is that fossil fuels themselves are actually a sink of carbon from the atmosphere. Forming fossil fuels removes carbon from the atmosphere. And geologically speaking, that coal and oil normally just sits in the earth. It's very rarely actually removed, except by maybe subduction or a river event like the volcanic eruptions that cause the Permian extinction. But humans have learned how to remove these fossil fuels from the earth, and they have rapidly released the CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, those fossil fuels formed over the course of millions of years, we have released the CO2 back in the atmosphere over the course of a few decades or centuries. We have taken into our hands a reversal of a process that really takes thousands and millions of years to form. And 
So I will mention before I move on also that in the ocean, carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the water undergoes a series of reactions to become the carbonate ion, which can combine with calcium to form calcium carbonate or the substance that makes up shells. And the living organisms themselves make these shells. They make these shells from the dissolved ions in the water and they play a prominent role in sequestering carbon. Um, and that is true on land um, via the formation of trees and cacti and other long lived species of plants that take up CO2 and ultimately use that to make hydrocarbons, the hydrocarbons that make up bark and pulp and wood. Not to mention that erosion of rocks actually removes some carbon dioxide via a chemical process we'll talk about. So that is a short overview of a simplified version of the carbon cycle. And we'll go over a couple of the specific facets of the carbon cycle in the next couple of slides. For example, volcanoes. And volcanoes can actually affect global climate in two separate ways. Volcanic eruptions do indeed emit carbon dioxide. And a lot of that carbon dioxide comes from subduction because the carbonate in shells in the ocean ultimately ends up on the seafloor when those creatures die, especially when the tiny amounts of carbonate in the tiny shells of phytoplankton accumulate over time and form these oozes on the ocean floor. As the ocean floor approaches a trench, it will eventually be subducted into that trench. In the trench, it's quite warm and the carbonates get liberated and the carbon gets released as CO2 and it ends up in the magma chambers of volcanoes and gets released when volcanoes erupt. So, car so volcanoes do release CO2 and when you have more subduction occurring on earth and when you have more volcanism that has the potential to lead to global warming to increase the emission of CO2 into the atmosphere. And it appears that during geologic periods in which there is more subduction worldwide overall because Remember that plate boundaries change. Plate boundaries can form and go away and they can change. But when there's more subduction happening, that causes more CO2 to be emitted because the subducted carbonate ends up in volcanoes. However, volcanoes actually also release, um, release aerosols. They release ash and other ejecta into the air. They release they release small airborne solid particles that are suspended in the air. And that's what you're seeing when you see the big cloud coming off a volcano. That's, that's little solid ash that's being suspended in the air. So on a short term scale, volcanic eruptions will eject little pieces of rock into the atmosphere. And those can remain in the atmosphere for years after an eruption and their presence in the atmosphere can block some sunlight and reduce the amount of solar radiation that's reaching the Earth. So a large volcanic eruption can actually cause global cooling. And some of the largest volcanic eruptions during human times have been followed by very cold years. Years such as the year without a summer that occurred in the late 19th century after a massive volcanic eruption on Tambora in Indonesia. And remember also that another event that released a large amount of debris into the atmosphere or the impact of an asteroid at the end of the Cretaceous, that killed most of the dinosaurs. And that was largely because the dust from the asteroid reduced the amount of solar radiation reaching Earth, which meant that the plants didn't photosynthesize as much and there was less food available for dinosaurs. So volcanoes have a mixed effect. Volcanoes can contribute to both global warming and to global cooling. So you have to consider how important the effect of CO2 is versus the amount of aerosols being released. Some volcanoes aren't all that explosive, and so the amount of CO2 being released by them might be more important. But you have to kind of you have to look at that you have to look at volcanic eruptions worldwide holistically, and the math doesn't add up. An estimate indicates that human activities release 35 gigatons of carbon dioxide every year. In contrast, an estimate taken for all of the active volcanoes in the world is an emission rate of about 0.26 gigatons per year. That is several orders of magnitude smaller. And not to mention, there has not been a marked increase in volcanic eruptions since 1800. So if volcanoes were responsible for, for the current 
climate change we're seeing, we would expect to see a lot more volcanic eruptions start in the 19th century and just more and more volcanic eruptions to the present. In reality, the amount of volcanic eruptions happening presently doesn't appear to be that much greater than the amount happening back in the 19th century. And also the numbers don't add up. So volcanoes cannot really be invoked to explain the current increase in CO2 emissions and temperature. Previously, I alluded to erosion, and this might be a little bit less familiar than volcanoes, but remember that erosion refers to the breaking down and removal of material, specifically of rock. And I've talked about how this happens physically, like how glaciers can either pluck or grind or abrade the rock away. But some erosion occurs via chemical reactions. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere reacts with rainwater, and this forms a very small amount of carbon of carbonic acid. This is what makes rainwater slightly acidic. And most of the minerals that make up the granite and the similar rocks making up the continental crust are minerals known as silicates. Their main ingredient is the element silica, and often they also have calcium ions attached to them. In the example equation shown on this slide, two carbon dioxide molecules and a water molecule interact with a calcium silicate mineral to produce silica, as well as calcium ions and bicarbonate ions. The bicarbonate combines with the calcium to produce water, calcium carbonate, and one carbon dioxide atom. So even though CO2 is produced at the end, notice that only one CO2 um, atom is made at the end, and two were used up. So as a result, one CO2 molecule is lost, and this process overall is a sink for atmospheric carbon dioxide. In practice, this, this takes CO2 out of the atmosphere and puts calcium and bicarbonate into water. Those end up in the ocean, and there, organisms like corals and snails expend the energy to combine that bicarbonate and calcium into their shells, which are made of calcium carbonate. And many familiar organisms like the nautilus and coral and less familiar ones like the phytoplankton we learned about in this course are said to precipitate, um, precipitate out um, dissolved calcium and bicarbonate into calcium carbonate. It's living organisms that provide the energy to do that. And a lot of carbonate is stored in the shells of the tiny unsung heroes of marine ecosystems, or phytoplankton. And as a sign of how diverse phytoplankton actually are, not all phytoplankton actually build their build the little shells in their cells out of carbonate. Some, like diatoms, actually do this out of silica. But for those that accumulate carbonate, um, they are a significant source of atmospheric CO2, because even though we can't see them, there are a lot of plankton in the ocean. So a healthy balance of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can depend very much on healthy ecosystems, including healthy marine ecosystems. A lot of, a lot of carbon sequestration is performed by organisms, and a lot of that happens in the form of phytoplankton doing this in the ocean. When these phytoplankton die, the carbonate in their bodies ends up on the ocean floor as these oozes. Their shells don't spontaneously turn back into CO2. Um, think about how we have dead, we have snail shells and we can have bits of leftover carbonate even after the coral or the snail has died. And the same is true of phytoplankton. And the hard shells hold up a lot longer after the softer parts. They end up on the seafloor as these oozes and the seafloor is moving. The seafloor is moving away from a spreading center and towards a subduction zone. Oceanic crust subducts. And when the tectonic plate that underlies the ocean subducts, it sinks into the mantle. And as the plate goes down into the mantle, it will carry the sediments on top of the plate. And that includes the oozes formed from this carbonate. What happens then? is that some of that carbon simply gets subducted deep into the mantle. It gets forms into graphite and into diamond and, into diamond and ends up in the mantle. Some of it also ends up, um, so a lot of it gets returned to the interior of the earth. And overall subduction is largely a sink of carbon. However, some of the carbon that gets subducted 
ends up being volatilized as CO2 and released into volcanoes. It gets released into the magma chamber and mixed into magma and released during volcanic eruptions. And subduction of carbonates has a mixed effect. It does release some, it does cause some to be put back in the volcano and released back into the atmosphere, but a lot of it just gets put away in the mantle. And geologically speaking, and geologically speaking, subduction, subduction puts carbon away. Some of the carbon gets released, and if you have a lot of subduction happening, that is going to cause more volcanic eruptions, and that will cause an increase in CO2 being released. But subduction plays a pretty strong role in putting carbon back into the mantle. Now, on land, well, actually everywhere, all photosynthetic organisms like phytoplankton or like plants on land take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to produce hydrocarbons for food, as well as to make their physical bodies and structures like the wood and bark and leaves. Plants also perform aerobic respiration and they convert some of their hydrocarbons using oxygen and produce carbon dioxide in the process. However, long lived plants that have hard structures like trees and cacti sequester a lot more carbon than they release via cell respiration because the carbon is stuck in the tree until the tree dies or is cut down. And this is one reason why deforestation aggravates the effects of anthropogenic climate change so much because cutting down forests take that, takes that sink of carbon away and the trees are often replaced by grasses or other smaller short-lived plants that don't do as good a job of sequestering carbon. And so in general, living organisms are made of, car are made of hydrocarbons. If a living organism eats another organism, the hydrocarbons in the prey get converted to CO2 inside the predator's body during the process of cell respiration. Eating organisms releases carbon dioxide and that really can't be helped. The same is true of decomposition and that's actually eating also, that's fungi and bacteria and other microorganisms eating and breaking down the organism. Fire does the same thing, excuse me, fire does the same thing too. Instead of the energy becoming available to living organisms though, that energy is just released as fire and CO2 is released in the smoke. Now, fossil fuels, remember, serve as a geologic process that prevents some of the hydrocarbons from being burned or eaten. If the organic matter is buried under the right circumstances, the pressure from burial will concentrate and preserve the hydrocarbons before they can be decayed and converted to carbon dioxide. Coal formed this way under layers upon layers of dead vegetation piling up in swamps. And oil forms when the remains of phytoplankton are trapped in mud before they can decompose. And that's why many oil bearing rocks are shale or rocks that originated as ocean muds. The same is true of natural gas. Natural gas forms alongside oil and gets trapped in these same sedimentary rocks. Geologically speaking, fossil fuel formation takes millions of years. And this is why fossil fuels are considered to be a non-renewable resource because they aren't being formed on a scale that we can observe in our lifetime. And we have upended the process by digging out tons of coal, of coal and oil and natural gas that took millions of years to form. We have dug them out over the scale of decades and centuries. Without our involvement, these fossil fuels would simply have stayed underground for millions of years continuing to keep that carbon out of the atmosphere. But we have thrown a wrench into the system of Earth by learning how to dig up all of this buried carbon and from a geological standpoint, burning it in a blink of an eye. One major consequence of this has been ocean acidification because the oceans are largely a buffer for carbon dioxide. Ocean water can dissolve a lot of carbon dioxide and it's regulated in part by the sequence of reactions between CO2 and the solid calcium carbonate that I mentioned earlier. And too much CO2 in the atmosphere has caused this to go out of balance. An excess of carbon dioxide means that there is a lot more CO2 in the oceans and a lot more carbonic acid in the oceans than usual. This has made it harder for ocean organisms to precipitate calcium carbonate and to build their shells, 
Studies have found that the larvae of crabs and snails are increasingly dying because their shells are a lot more weak and fragile than before, because they can't precipitate enough carbonate to build them. And corals have also come under stress for this reason, as well as from the rising temperature of the water. And this has led to coral bleaching. Coral bleaching occurs when coral, which rely on symbiotic algae to survive, expel that algae. And if this occurs for an extended period of time, the coral will die. The diagram on the left shows you the, it shows you it basically where it's, where it's, where it's red. That means that the amount of carbonate in, the, in this form, in this case, a mineral called aragonite, um, that it's made of carbonate, but less of it can be, less of it can precipitate in the ocean water. Um, and that means it's harder for these animals and phytoplankton to build their shells. And that corresponds to in to a drop in pH or an overall acidification of the oceans caused by anthropogenic climate change. And I'll briefly outline the chemical reactions happening here. What happens is that the increased amount of carbon of carbonic acid produces a large amount of H plus ions and more H plus ions are produced by this process than are by carbonate ions. And this makes an imbalance, an imbalance in the reaction between bicarbonate and carbonate, or when HCO3 converts to H plus and to CO3 negative two, or when H plus and CO3 negative two combine to form bicarbonate. Some of the carbonate that's already in the, in the ocean combines with the extra H plus ions to make more bicarbonate. So you get more bicarbonate and less carbonate. And less carbonate means that you have less material available for snails and corals and phytoplankton to build their shells. I briefly touched upon the term feedback previously. And in a climatology context, a feedback is a, respond to a is, a, is a response to a change. And it can be either a positive feedback in which the result amplifies the effect of the change and causes it to accelerate further or a negative feedback in which the result somehow undoes the change and brings the system back closer to equilibrium. And equilibrium means stability. In science, it means that the interaction between the sun, which provides the solar energy to Earth, and the ocean, and the ice sheets, and the biosphere, or the living things, the, the interactions between those systems are stable over a long period of time when the system is in equilibrium. Minor variations might occur, but they don't take the system out of whack, so to speak. In science, we have to establish whether a system is or was in equilibrium to make sure that we can actually use our data to draw conclusions. CO2 levels in the atmosphere, for example, roughly correlate with ice levels and global temperatures, but this interpretation is only consistent if the CO2 is in equilibrium, meaning that there isn't an excess of CO2 being added or removed in a short period of time. Presently, a lot of CO2 is being added to the atmosphere, meaning that the, meaning that the Earth system is out of equilibrium. The, we have an instability. Right now, we have many cases of positive feedback, taking the Earth farther and farther out of equilibrium. And one confusing thing about the term positive feedback is that it's kind of amusing to me. It has nothing to do with whether the result is good or not. Positive feedback often involve, positive feedback involves processes that bring the earth further and further out of equilibrium and into deleterious conditions, into conditions of a rapidly warming world in which deserts are spreading and hurricanes are getting stronger and rainfall patterns are changing and where people can grow crops is being affected and where people can live is being affected and people um, are being driven out of their homes by rising sea levels and by spreading deserts. So this is all the result of positive feedback of runaway climate change, but it's not a good effect. So um, one example of positive feedback in the current climate crisis is that 
if you increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that causes the atmospheric temperature to go up. And when the temperature goes up and the world is warmer, that causes glaciers to retreat and ice shelves and sea ice to melt. Now, the white glaciers and sea ice have higher albedo than the rocks and the ocean. The ocean is dark, rocks are kind of gray to dark colored. So when the ice gets, when the ice melts and the sea is exposed or the land is exposed, that means that more of Earth's surface is darker. More of Earth's surface has lower albedo and the rock and the ocean are absorbing more radiation than before. Ice reflects radiation. The ocean and the Earth, as in like the rock underneath the glaciers, absorbs more radiation. So this is one example of how global warming is being accelerated. The ice melted because it's getting warmer and now there's even less ice and it's going to get even warmer because the ice isn't reflecting any more of that radiation away. Um, and the ocean acidification is another debacle because it turns out that carbon dioxide dissolves better in cold water than in warm water. With the oceans getting warmer, less CO2 can be accommodated without that being converted to carbonic acid. The oceans are no longer as effective a site of absorption or a buffer for CO2. Less CO2 can be absorbed by the oceans as they get warmer, and thus more CO2 remains in the atmosphere and continues to wreak havoc on the Earth systems. Another example is permafrost, because when the frozen layer of soil in the Arctic or the permafrost melts, that releases the methane that is locked up in the ice. So the permafrost is melting because the air temperatures are getting warmer, but then that gets accelerated because with the air temperatures getting warmer, the permafrost melts and that releases methane and the methane makes the earth even warmer. So it's, it's kind of a mess. And earth is now very much in a period of disequilibrium. CO2, methane and other greenhouse gases are being released in the, into the atmosphere much, much faster than they can be absorbed by natural processes. It will take, it takes a long time to grow enough to grow, to grow trees to offset CO2. It takes a long time for carbonate formation to do this. Fossil fuels also form over millions of years, but we're releasing CO2 much faster than that. And it will take centuries or millennia for levels to return to normal ranges. And that is assuming that society immediately jumps to zero emissions. We have not had much luck at doing that. It's realist, more realistically, we're going to be leveling off emissions slowly. And that's even, that's even assuming that human society actually does that. We are going to be stuck with the consequences of the greenhouse gases that have been already put into the atmosphere for decades. Um, and for, periods on the scale of several generations. And we are still releasing more CO2 and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Even if we get to zero emissions, we're going to be stuck with the consequences of the greenhouse gases that we've already put into the atmosphere for quite a long time. But we're not stopping, we're kind of piling it on. So that's pretty ominous. And an even more ominous precedent for this is the Permian extinction. And remember how I hinted that it had to do with the climate. It, it was similar to the current climate crisis when I talked about it over the course of the Earth History Unit. Because remember that the Permian extinction, which occurred before the dinosaur era and wiped out a lot of marine life, as well as many land creatures, including the ancestors of mammals, not all of them, but a lot of them, the best hypothesis is that this was caused by volcanic eruptions, specifically when large lava flows ignited coal across a part of Siberia, a large part of Siberia, a part of Siberia about as big as that's looking at this, that's about as big as the state of Alaska. So a coal field the size of the state of Alaska was ignited, releasing a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere over the course of a couple decades or hundreds of years geologically speaking, not very long. And all of the CO2 released into the atmosphere seems to have caused 
global warming, as well as ocean acidification. And this appears to be why the marine ecosystems were hit so harshly, because ocean acidification was, ocean acidification made it harder for marine organisms to build their shells, and that caused them to die, and many of them just went extinct completely. Um, again, 96% of all marine life went extinct, and that appears to have been from ocean acidification caused by runaway CO2 emissions. And that's really not something we want to happen again. We don't, we really don't want to wipe out 96% of all marine life. That will be, that's going to be ecological disaster and really cause a mess to put it mildly. And land life was not hit quite as badly, but three quarters of all land life being wiped out is pretty grim. So we don't want to replicate the Permian extinction, but it kind of seems like what we are doing is running an uncontrolled experiment to replicate the conditions of the Permian extinction. Not that this is something that's been, not that this is something that people really thought out to begin with because people didn't understand the connection between burning fossil fuels and CO2, but continuing to do this is a really terrible idea. Continuing to do this and continuing to, to deny that CO2 is causing climate change and continuing to pump out fossil fuel emissions at the same time, that's, that's a really bad idea. And it's very, it's irresponsible to put it nicely. So on that wonderful note, we've, we, I've summarized, I've given you a, a short summary of what's happening in terms of the current climate change crisis and how that relates to overall and how, and how that relates to cycling of carbon naturally and how carbon cycling would occur without the, without the influence of just an excess amount of fossil fuels being burned. So we'll talk more specifically about how this has affected Antarctica in the next class. Thank you again for being patient with the schedule changes and with some of these lectures being released quite late at night. Um, I will see some of you in the review session on Wednesday and I will release lecture 16 on Wednesday as well. So have a wonderful night and I will see you all soon.